All right, here we are again for another session on the Rich Life Projects. And today, a man who's been through it all, but not only been through it all, but come out the other side and inspiring and uh, just being an amazing human in regards to what his experiences are and, and inspiring other people. The legend of Newcastle, obviously. Ali, they call him, <laughs> in the boxing realm. You do. Now, that's I do. Craig Hamilton, welcome to the Rich Life Projects, my friend. G'day, Rich. It's nice to see you again, and thanks mate, for having me. Mate, it's been a pleasure, and lucky you walked past the coffee shop this morning, and yeah. we're, we're connected. We're again. So, again, what's been happening? What's been happening in Craig Hamilton's life right at this present moment? Right now, right now, present moment, I'm talking to you, no, which exactly. is great, yeah. and I'm big on the present moment, only moment we've got, and uh, that's been one of the challenges for me in my life, is to not be present, mm. um, and we'll talk a bit about that, you know, a lot of stuff from the past that you carry with you, and then you worry too much about the future, what's happening next week, next month, and you're all over the place, so I'm very conscious now of being absolutely present, so... What I'm doing at the moment, I'm still broadcasting with the ABC. I've got a good work-life balance. I'm doing good stories. I like being behind the microphone. That's what I am. I'm a communicator. I'm a broadcaster. And uh, I'm excited to say I'm working on a documentary this year, which we've only just finalised or had approval for and got uh, funding for, for this year on suicide prevention, which is I'm really passionate wow. about, want to make a difference there. Suicide rates, way too high. Crazy rates. Yeah. Crazy rates. So that's what I'm doing. Yep. Yep. And everything else, obviously training, you got, you mm-hmm. still doing a bit of fitness and keeping the, the mind and the mental health, uh, at ease as well. Yeah, look, uh, I do some boxing, as you know. Yeah, I used to do yep. some training with you yeah, when you yeah, when you were in Newcastle. Yep. I still do pads. Yep. I only do pads once a week yep. in the ring. I wish I could do it more often, and I do need to prioritise that because from a physical point of view, yep. boxing is brilliant. Yep. From a mental health point of view, it is even better. It clears your head and you just walk out of the ring Um Energised, you go to work, you feel good, yeah. and it's the best yeah, like, thing. Like you've achieved something for the yeah. day, even before you even start the day. That's right. Yep. So let's go back into Craig Hamilton, the little little baby old Craig Hamilton. Where was growing up for you? What was gr- the growing up stages for you? Well, I was born in Singleton in the Hunter Valley, the so Singleton. the old Singleton. Singo. <laughs> old Singo. I, yeah, I was on a dairy farm. My dad was a dairy farmer, um, and so my first experience of life was, uh, you know, cows. I grew up around cows and milking cows. Milking cows. You know, early, very early teens, and even before I was 10, I was there with dad just having a look and learning the lessons, you know, make sure you shut the gate. You weren't <laughs> you weren't born in a tent, were you? You know, that <laughs> sort the, of stuff. The old saying. Uh, the old saying. I copped a fair bit of that, and, uh, you know, if I mucked up a bit, which uh, I did, <laughs> it, it, the, the saying was uh, dad used to say, you need a bit more work. Yeah, you know, uh, you got too much energy. And he's probably right. Um, but... So that was life in Singleton and, look, great place to grow up. Played all my rugby there, uh, played all my cricket there. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, you know, for sports. much better cricketer than I was ever a rugby player. You really? Yeah. Oh, much better. <laughs> As anyone who saw me play rugby, yeah. I'll tell you. But uh, so that was that was great. Good place to good place to grow up. And I was there till I was seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and I got my first job down here in Newcastle. Yeah. And schooling was in uh, Singleton. Obviously, yes. a, a ducks and a scholar at school. Yeah, ducks. I got a, <laughs> got a few ducks. Yeah, du- yeah ducks. A few uh, <laughs> classes. That's about it. Yeah. No, look, average student. Yep. Average student. I didn't probably um, put as much time into schoolwork as I could have, yeah. but I don't look back at that with any regret at all because I had a great time. A lot of school life was playing sport and I was very focused on that, hanging around with mates, having a good time and trying not to stress too much and, and trying to stay in class and not be kicked out yeah. for talking too much. Yeah. That, that, was main, that was the main focus. But, yeah, so average student, I don't know whether I could have done better or not, but I think from the, those school days, I think I've done okay with yeah, what I've, what I've yeah. done in the career. Yep, 
And when you say uh, had some good times, uh, like through school, after school, what's what's the good times for Craig Hamilton back in the day? Oh, look, um, that's a good question. Yeah. It was a good question because there were so many good times. There was, you know, junior rugby union. I used to love playing junior rugby. And, uh, you know, the games that spring to mind straight away, if you're talking about junior rugby, I'm talking about under 10s, yeah, right? Okay. So we yeah, used yeah, to play right. for Singleton, the single, mighty Singleton Bulls. Ooh. We would play against Musselbrook. Yep. We'd play against Scone. We'd play against Marundi. So you're up the top of the yeah, right. top of the. Uh, the Hunter Valley, and and so there was only four teams, mm. only four teams in the comp. So you played them a couple of times a year, and the Murrundi games were the real challenge because you, you're talking in those days before they fixed the road up. It's it's probably two hours to get up there from Singleton, yeah, true, true. windy road. Yep. So you get up there, middle of winter, it's freezing <laughs> in Murrundi. There's literally frost on the ground, freezing frost, and so it's icy cold. It's cruel. <laughs> you know, there we are, ten, a, 10 years of age, and we've got the shorts on and the boots and the socks, and we're running out getting and getting, on the we're, legs. Oh. we're getting tackled. We're trying to tackle. At the time, you think, well, you know, this is normal. Yeah. It wasn't really normal. No, it was, no, it was uh, yeah, it was hard work. But it, you look back, and that, well, it was fun, yeah, in the cricket days and the, and the rugby days through school. By the time I got to be about uh, 16 or 17, I, I really started to show a bit of promise at yep. cricket. Yep. Started to, I captained the school cricket side and, yeah. and we had a good side. Uh, we actually beat, we beat uh, Farrah High in Tamworth and, oh. not, and not many people used to beat Farrah High. No way. They were, in, they were like very good at every sport. Rugby league. I yep. used, obviously living in town for myself. Yeah. We used to play uh, Farrah. Obviously we used to fight a lot of them too in the street when they used to come in on Saturday nights. But, <laughs> of course you did. But that was, Saturday, you know, that was sport. That was yeah. the Saturday night special. But yeah, they, yeah. they were very good school, that one. Yeah. And then we got to Newcastle. Uh, we are in from Singleton. So yeah, Singleton boys come down. We played one of the, the Newcastle schools. We actually beat Merriweather. Did you? We beat yeah, Merriweather yeah. and we made the final against Jesmond, oh, Jesmond wow. High. And I can't even remember if we won that. Yeah, I, true. I, Maybe we didn't win. Yeah. Maybe we didn't win. But for, for a team from the Hunter Valley to, to knock over some pretty fair sides was, yeah. uh, you know, it was, a good, it was a good thing. It was the best that the Singleton team had ever done in that competition. Yeah, wow. Well, mm. That's crazy. That's crazy. So when you get to the you, – you're obviously going through that stage. What was, what was the first job? What was the first job for mm. you? You won't believe me. You I'm, won't believe I, me I probably I won't, you. but I want – I left school. Uh, I did my HSC yep. in 19 – 80. Yep. Uh, yeah, 1980. Started work in a coal mine. Really? In Newcastle. Yeah. In January of 1981. Wow. It was the only job I ever applied for. Yeah. And I just saw it on the notice board at school. Walked past it one day. Mining cadet ships. Yep. BHP collieries. Wow. I thought, geez. Didn't even think what it involved. <laughs> Just thought, well, there's a job. I'll apply for it. Well, I got a, an interview down in Newcastle, went out to a mine called John Darling Colliery mm -hmm. and was interviewed there. And the, the guys who interviewed me, Dick McLean was one. He's a bit of a legend in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. And they, Dick was more interested uh, and in whether what sort of life I had in my sporting yeah. days. And, and when he heard, out I was, heard that I was captain, of the cricket side, he was interested because he want they those positions they wanted leaders, yeah, okay. and they wanted team players, yeah, and somebody who could you know get a side together. Yep. So that's the first job, and I was underground before I was eighteen, and that was a culture shock. Wow, mm. that would have been good money back then. Look, it was better money than my mates were earning, yeah, yep. but still comparatively. It wasn't. It still wasn't huge money. Yeah, uh, really. The mines in Newcastle didn't pay a lot of money, yeah. but uh, I think for going underground. And yeah. I've thought, uh, looking back, I've thought this for the entire time. I was sixteen years underground. Yeah, yeah. 16, oh, really, sixteen years. Wow. So I always thought uh, I can't believe that I worked underground for sixteen years and. The most money, as far as a year, yeah. a year's wages was concerned, was fifty-two thousand dollars. No way, considering mm. what they're on now. 
like yeah, uh, and it's all to, relative. Yeah, Everybody's true, true. getting a in, everyone's in getting a lot times. A, a lot better money. But my last year in the mines was nineteen ninety seven. But I could tell you stories about the conditions underground, the things, the close shaves that oh. happened underground, um, which re- you up. really. I really shook my head sometimes yeah. to say, "Well, why am I here?" Because it got it got a bit it got a I'd bit be, rugged. I'd be, I'd be fucking hopeless underground because the claustrophobic side of things in life. Mm. Like if I feel like I'm like smothered in, fuck, I just I go into panic. Mm. Even if I was to lay there and someone was sitting on me and I can't move, it's like a whole mechanism. Like fuck, I'm panicking. If you been underground, have, how how far underground? Well, the from the surface of yeah. the mine. To the the sh- to the coal seam, mm. straight down about three hundred meters straight down, wow. and then once you get underground, there's roadways going out which are mined, and as the further they go, you've got to get in transport. And the mine I worked in at that time was yeah. track mounted transport, so it was it was um, little locos, yeah, little right. little ra- little railway locos, and they used to take you out to where you would work. And so we're talking kilometres. Really? Kilometres. So any any sort of claustrophobia, no. you, you wouldn't last. You yeah. just can't afford to be claustrophobic. You couldn't do it and work in a mine. I, can, I, would, I would kill myself. I'd be like, ah, I would be going crazy. I couldn't do it. So you spent 16 years in the coal mm. mines. Yep. When you got out of there, what, what was the transition from going to the coal mines? Then what would – what did we go into? Well, it's. I still think it's one of the most amazing transitions in terms of careers that that I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard of a transition in careers like the one I experienced. Uh, by year 16, I had well and truly had enough of being underground. In mm. fact, I'd had enough of being underground six years prior. Yeah, the true. last the last six years of my mining career weren't enjoyable. I it was it was soul destroying in the respect that I wanted to do something else. Mm. I knew I could do something else, and I knew by that stage I wanted to work in the media. I wanted to be a broadcaster. I wanted to be a footy commentator. I wanted to be a cricket commentator. But the thought you have in your mind is, okay, you know what you want to do, yeah. but how the hell do, how you, do you do it? it? You've yep. got to find the the process. Yep. And so I got an opportunity, and I've told this story a few times. It's a fork in the road story, mm. you know, how you can you go one way, doors. sliding doors. Yeah. You go one way, something happens, you go the other way, totally different. Yeah. So. A broadcasting, um, we're in Canberra and I'm still mining. Yeah. I'm still yeah, mining. True. And I'm playing for Newcastle in the in the representative side for cricket. Cricket, yeah. So we're at Marnica Oval, which is the number one ground in, in Canberra. They've played test matches there. It's, oh, a, true. it's a great ground, wow. Marnica. So the our team's our team's batting, and I was a bowler, so I, I batted well down. I think about a number ten. Yeah. The one of the commercial radio stations was broadcasting the match. So they're calling, they're doing a ball-by-ball commentary. During one of the breaks, one of their um, producers came down. They said to our team, because we had our openers batting, they said, look, we want one of you blokes to come down and have a go as a commentator. Many will say, oh, you jumped up. He jumped up, raced down there, (laughs) which is not the truth, which is not the truth. I didn't even consider that I would go down to do some commentary, but all the boys in the team said, look, you never shut up. You're always, <laughs> you're always impersonating cricket commentators. So, <laughs> listen, get down there. So they put me on and I did the the colour commentary, not the ball-by-ball ball commentary, and loved it. Yeah. Loved right. it. Straight away, could do it straight away, right, and I right. thought this is what I want to do. Yeah. So I think – there's the fork in the road. Yep. If I stay sitting up there with the boys in the cricket side and don't do make the decision to go down there on yep. that radio, I could well be coal mining. It, it, it could be anything, yep. but it probably wouldn't have been broadcasting. I don't know that for sure, yep. Rich, but it wouldn't have – certainly wouldn't happen as quickly as it did, and it still took six years. Yeah, really? Yep. Wow. 
And from that moment on, I was concentrating on how am I going to make that happen? And I got a few opportunities and the same in, you know, for anyone in life, mm. you'll get opportunities. Yeah. You just got to be ready to take, to take them, them yeah. and be brave enough to take them. Yeah. And uh, so I was, even though I hadn't given away the mining job, yeah. it, these little opportunities with the ABC to yeah. do some commentary, do a bit of presenting, yeah. sports reports. Yeah. And uh, after a while, I had to leave. I wanted to leave. I didn't have a full-time job to go to. I had a mortgage, yeah, had a family. Yeah, and I said, but look, it's either now or never because mm. I don't want to be here in 10 years. Yeah. So I left. Yeah, right. It's a, sometimes it's a big move like, and I've been in that position myself personally when you go working working for a, a company where you're comfortable, where you're getting a weekly fortnightly wage, but your dream is to jump and do this. Mm. That moment when you go, I'm I'm cutting the life cord of comfortable and letting that sail away and fuck, now I've got to survive, as you say, mortgage children. Did that, did that? You want to know how I did it? How did you do that? I worked freelance for two years because I didn't have a job. Yeah. Right. I didn't have a job. The mortgage was extended to 30 years. So the minimum payment, the absolute minimum payment that had to be paid on the house, that was done. Yeah. Because we just didn't have the income anymore. Yeah. I. What did the host- wife say? Look, she was fan- <laughs> she was fantastic. She's yeah. fantastic because, um, the from a money side of uh, point of view, she worries more about money than I do. Mm. I've never been motivated by money, and look, I understand completely. You know, you've got kids, and at that stage, I you know I've got three kids, still have, and the, but they were all um, at the age where they're fully dependent. Yeah, yeah. Financially, mortgage to pay, expenses to you know got to pay the bills. So that was one thing. And so, right, I've got to do my best to earn a living. Yep. Hosted trivia nights. Did you? Yeah, emceed, right. emceed functions. I wrote in the papers, the Newcastle um, Herald. I think I had a column in the Newcastle Herald at that stage. The Sun Herald, uh, the journos, sports journos that have holidays at Christmas time, Sunday Telegraph sports journos, uh, Barry Tui, and before uh, Baz, it was uh, George Pigford. They'd have their holidays. Yeah. Someone's got to write the sport. I said, I'll do it. I can do it. So I'd get some income through that period, started to do a little bit with the ABC, hosted a Saturday morning program, went for four hours. That's the only thing I was doing on radio. Yeah. Started to get paid. You know how much? 80 bucks. <laughs> 80 for four hours? Four hours and, and produce that as well. So it yeah. all it all added up, but yeah. I made $40,000 in that first year, 40 grand, just by, you know, little bits and pieces. Hustling. and. Yeah, hustling basically yeah. needed to be done. 100%. And the next year I did the same. Yep. Made about the same amount of money, yep. 40 grand. And then the opportunity comes. There's a full time job at the ABC as a presenter and, sports, and a sports reporter. Yep. And I applied and got it. Bang, done. Mm. Isn't it amazing? But when you get to the stage, because humans, when they're in this comfortable zone, they're just in the comfortable zone. And then. It gets time where you've got to hustle. Yeah. And I always say, when it comes to humans having to survive this life, they will do whatever it's got to be done to do it. But everyone says, oh, would you leave a full-time job to do this? That's not paying at the moment. No way. Because they're so comfortable in that that scenario. But when you're comfortable in that scenario, but your dream is here, and then all of a sudden you go, I've got to fucking hustle. I'm leaving a full-time job mm. that I don't want to do anymore. I've done it for yeah. 16 years. Now I've got to hustle hard to make money. And you say that $40,000 you made in that first year of the freelancing and that, but that would have been the most enjoyable $40,000 you have probably ever mm. made in your life. I earned every cent of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet you cent. did. There was a lot to do to get that $40,000. Yep. But I knew I could do it. Yeah. That was the thing. At the start of it, I I, I thought I could do it. Yeah. But after that, in a very short period of time, I knew I could yeah. do it. 
and it was all in. It yeah. was boots in yeah. by that stage. And uh, there, there it was. I had the full time job and started to do some sideline work with the ABC on the rugby league. And yeah. then I thought, yep, yeah. that's what I want to do. Yeah. And you, and you know, obviously my story being in Newcastle, and we had a gym, yeah, in Hall Street that my brother and I, and we had a falling out, obviously, with our business person that we were in in there with. It was a bit of a fake dude, and we didn't want to be with. But after that. And I'd just got my children in Newcastle to yeah. raise them. And you get down to, as you say, the hustling part of it. I went and done at another gym, which I was very thankful for, and done PTs. I was doing 10 PTs a day. I was making it work to make mm. sure I could survive but raise my two children. So that part I 100% get when mm. you go, it might be the most money you make, but you're on a hustle. And you and I always say, if people believe in their passions or their dreams, it doesn't matter. They will make things happen. Mm. You'll find a way. There's always a way. Yeah. Just depends on how passionate and how driven you really are. Mm. The ones who go, fuck, too hard for me, I'll go back and next minute they're packing coals or working a Macca's just going, fuck, I tried but I just didn't succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ones who don't try hard enough. Yeah. But that, that hustle, it takes a bit of hustle. So when you got to that stage, you're going, you hustled for the first year, 40000 enjoyable money you made, but you're not focused on the money. You're focused on your, not so much even career, just passionate about what you're doing. Mm. Then all of a sudden they offer you the full-time job at ABC. What's what's that part like? Is it Was that another stage of fulfilment? Go, now I get to do what I fucking love. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. That was worth the the weight and that was worth the effort and that was the and that didn't happen in 5 minutes no, that didn't it happen never in does. 5 minutes like you know people say oh uh, yeah you're an overnight success that takes 20 years so and it's true you there's a lot of hard work you got to hone your skills yep. and my wife Louise there's been occasions when people have said people who don't know us that well but yep. but you know know us, yeah. have said, oh, how lucky's Craig, you know, they'll say to, say to Louise, how, how lucky's Craig having that job, you know, with the ABC, he just call, walked into. calling the footy, you know, that's dream job, how lucky. And a few times she's turned on a heel and said, there's no luck there. There's a hell of a lot of hard work and there's a hell of a lot of commitment and there's been a hell of a lot of times when he hasn't been here and he's missed family stuff mm. because he's been building that career and we've had to compensate yeah. and we've had to make, you know, um, we've had to, you know, put ourselves out yeah. for that compromise. Yeah. We've had to compromise yeah. and it's the truth. Yeah, 100%. It's the truth. 100%. And, mm. and, so, and it's very important when, as you say, and I'm going to use you as an example, when you're going on that personal journey – to reach your goals mm. and you've got someone beside you through thick and thin who is on your team mm. makes things a lot easier to hustle hard, mm. doesn't it? Especially yeah. obviously you've got the kids, as you say, you're trying to raise the kids, mortgage, but having a good woman behind you when you're going through the hard times because they're going through the hard times as well, mm. but having that support and you're trying to reach for your dream, that is, that is – a great combination that some people do have, some people don't, but it's very lucky when you do have that that support. Yeah, we we're Team Hamilton. That's team right. Hamilton. It's, it's it. you know <laughs> as as um as, as open and as friendly uh, as I am with the media, and this is what I do. You yeah. know, I'm I'm a communicator, yeah. and I love doing this stuff, and I love being a, presenting myself behind the microphone and commentating. Louise is the opposite. You know, really don't. Oh, look. I want to be seen. No, I'm not really interested no. in that. There's been a few things that I, I wanted to involve her in because yep. she deserves the credit, you know. But no, I'll sit in the background and we'll probably get to talk about the books, the, you know, a couple oh, of books I've, will be uh, because... I've written. And that's the only thing that I've been able to get her involved in. Yeah, true. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's, let's go. So you're on, on the radio, you, you found your dream job. Your career started, what, around uh, Brookhouse with ABC 
around the eight, uh, 94, I was going to say 84, I d- 94-ish. I That's know. when I f- first started doing some part-time stuff. Okay. Uh, which, casual, yep. casual, so I had the you know, Saturday morning show. I started to do a little bit of sideline. I The first NRL grand final I worked yep. on yep. was Canterbury against Manly. Okay. In 1995. Okay, yep. And that game was a huge upset. The Bulldogs won and beat and beat Manly, and Manly were almost unbackable favourites, and I was on the sideline for that game. So You'd have been yelling, yelling oh, the commentary. Well, yeah. I love this. <laughs> yeah, well, I was close. You know, yeah. it's the best seat in the house. You're, yeah. you're two metres from the sideline, and you're commentating on grand finals, and that was the beginning. Yeah. Mm. And you've and you've done a lot of, obviously when the the Knights are playing local because I I think when we uh, sort of connected when I was in in Newcastle as well, you got me into the box you know mm-hmm. to experience and it, it was different too because you could actually hear the referees talking. Mm. I didn't I didn't know that before. I think uh, Bobcat. Was in there that Andrew day. Ryan, the Andrew Ryan, legendary Bulldogs captain. Yes, yeah, he's he part was, of the commentary he was in team. The boo- uh, booth with us three. There was mm. three of us in there, and I remember because I remember walking out of the booth and Steve Roach, who I used to idolise, kicking. That's Steve Roach. Wow, he's and then big, just, isn't he? Blo- oh, <laughs> blocker, <laughs> blocker is a blocker, <laughs> yeah. mate. But that that was a great experience for me. But just to see you work behind the scenes and what you do and what mm. the media is all about when you're commentating, it's. Mm. You you got to be on all the time, so it's a very quick thinking, quick witted uh, thing that's happening in that that I seen, and I was I was sort of I was impressed to be honest. I was happy to be in there because it was free to get in the football. Yeah. <laughs> You've always been like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I I work best when I get things for free. Nah, but it, just in regards to that, just that work there, then. That must be that must be just the buzz of turning up to the stadium, mm. getting ready. What what things when you're just about to commentate? Because you you find all different uh, occupations they g themselves up. There's all different things. Mm-hmm. Is there is there a thing where you g yourself up before commentating? Because I know like the. Bruce Buffers of you know they'll be <clears throat> they'll clear their throat they'll be yeah and they'll go through their lines or something like that. Mm-hmm. Is there something in particular when you ready to call off because you're calling the the whole game as it's mm-hmm. as it's going? Is there something that in preparation that you do? Well, the number one thing was you certainly got to do your research. So you got to know the two teams who are playing. You got to know what they look like. Yeah. And after a while of doing it, three or four years in, that wasn't such a big deal because each of the teams, each of the squads, didn't change that much. And so you got to know most of the players. You know, say fifteen of the players, and then they might bring two in. There might be two new players or four new players the next year. So clearly you've got to do your homework on those. Exactly, yeah. You've got to know the changes. You've got to know what they look like, where they're playing on the field. That's the you, – you've the got to know that. That's the bread and butter. But as far as getting ready for games, I used to have this adrenaline rush you, before yeah. before the calls. And, it you know, you're, it's like doing anything. I think if you're getting ready, if, you, if you're not a bit excited – to do it, then you're you not going to be on your game. You it's like be, anything. Yeah. But the the other thing was, it was it's, it's also like sport in that don't play the game before you need to. Yeah. Don't play it the day before or don't play it in the morning of the day that you're going to compete or call a game because yeah. you, every chance you'll be flat. Yeah. And so then the key moments were, then the goal is to – you're painting word pictures on radio. People can't – unless they're at the ground. Yeah, that's right. People driving their car, sitting at home, if they're listening to the radio out in the back deck, they can't see what's going on. No. So you've got to paint a picture, picture and yeah. that's the skill in, in radio. Very good. And get those links in in the uh, with the players, get those links between the breaks. And look, Rich, I've said this a thousand times, mate. There's so many things in life I can't do. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could write a book on the things I can't do um, that I'm bloody hope. I couldn't change but, a spark but, plug or a washer <laughs> no, if hey, you wanted me to. Me neither. But me neither. I can call live sport. Yeah. 
and I, and I've seen it live myself, and and even even as you say, the more experience you get, it's it's I get that you get it, uh, you get to know the player, so you know when that number's running the ball, you know who it is. But when I was with you that day in the box, and I'm hearing you call these names and Bobcat calling these names, I'm like, fuck, how do they keep a track of who's running what? Who's? But again, it gets back to the simple thing: is studying studying your material, studying the team, mm. studying you know having some sort of thing in your head going, okay, and and sometimes just going freelancing, going off the cuff when you're seeing what's happening, having your experienced view of what's going on is the skill that only good people have got when it comes to commentating, obviously. so Yeah, well, I could always do it. I mean, I could do it as a kid. You know, I used to win, you know, the the games when you're 13, 14, 15, and, you know, it's only a couple of mates who are playing, and, you know, who do you think provided the commentary? Yeah. <laughs> so I was doing it. Ray Warren always said uh, that he used to call, I think it was matches floating down, you know, in the stream. Oh, at really? June yeah. e, there was something he used to call. I might be stuffing this up, Rabs, anyway, but <laughs> that's how he learned how to call. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, I used to do it. I, I, and you listen, yeah. you listen to the good ones, yeah. the good commentators, and you learn from them. And if you're not doing that, yeah. then you're not giving yourself a fair, a, uh, a fair crack. Uh, but if you if you have to name one of the best to ever do it in in the rugby league, mm-hmm. what name just throws up straight away? Well, obviously there's a few because I've worked with a few, yeah. and they've all been fantastic. But in terms of live sport. And this is as an all rounder, if you like, can call a number of sports and nail them all. It's David Morrow. Really? David Morrow is the best live sport caller that I've ever worked with, ever listened to. Now, he can call the races. Mm. He can call the horses. Number one, I have huge respect for anyone who can call the races. Hundred okay, mate, because you, what you're the- getting you know, every race you're getting different colours. You can't tell what the horses look like. Mate, that's – You've I'm got the you numbers and they're a mile away and you've got the, you know, the, the jockey silks on or the trainer silks on. So he can do that. He Mate. can do that. He can call rugby league as well as anybody. He's called rugby. He's called soccer. He's done cricket. He's done test cricket, one-day cricket. Wow. So he's – Dave Morrow. He's I, I the best. I have heard that name, but I really have not focused on yeah. who that is, but – Yeah. That well, is a skill. Well, David's still calling football for 2GB. Is In, in Sydney – and Peter Wilkins is the other one. Now, Wilco gave me my start, and he was a very passionate, um, descriptive. Wilco was the Shakespeare of rugby league callers. He used to have this way with words, you know, that yeah. he would uh, – it was a performance yeah, yeah, with right. Wilco, but still a very good caller yep. and a high energy. And he always used to say, he said, you haven't done a good call in rugby league, if there's not a bit of blood on the floor. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what he used to say. Wow. That that is that is crazy. I thought, I thought uh, like, Rabs, I thought. Well, Rabs, Rabs started in radio, yeah, Ray okay. Warren, but he's best known for his television commentary. Yes, yes. And he's the voice. That's right. He's, that's he's, right. he's the best in, in he's the, the best in television. Yeah, television. I mean, it's, it's daylight second. Yeah, 100%. It's daylight second 100%. In, because he knows – He's got this great voice. Yeah. You know, this wonderful, Big, deep. deep voice. Well, rubs. Yeah, rubs uh, <laughs> down the short side, fatty, <laughs> you know, and Sturlo and the yeah, boys. So, yeah. wonderful voice. Yeah. Um, ever so accurate. I remember, you know, I've listened to him and, and watched games at yeah. Ray Warren's call for many years. I don't think he makes many mistakes. No, I was if say. he If he does, I haven't seen them. Yeah. And that's another that's yeah. another gift. Yeah. So he's he's the best, and but but there's plenty of others. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah. Uh, who are yeah, good. He seems he seems like that Rabs. Like oh, I'm money on outside. I never met him. I know he's uh, I know his son, but in regards to that, he's like it. It really appeared to me when he calls something uh, the rugby league on TV. He was like a perfectionist. Mm. He did not want to make a mistake, and mm. if he did make a mistake, it would probably just chew him to pieces. Mm. Or if other people made a mistake around him, he'd be like ropeable. But he just seemed—he like, just seemed like that talent that there's not many mistakes in his 
No, in there's his, not. There's not. But that's and, over. And I look, suppose over time of and, and Rabs. I never. I never worked with him. Yep. Uh, on on air, but the I don't think it, it is part of his uh, makeup to have a crack at someone for making a mistake. Yeah. You know, and and he's not that perfectionist who just throws chairs and throws programs. That don't ever do not that like again. The present time. <laughs> no, he, he, he's not. He's not like that, and yeah. uh, he he doesn't waste words or overuse words, and that's why it, it makes him a great television commentator. Apart from calling the play and who's got the ball, he doesn't use words to describe what everyone can see. And Richie Benno was the best on television on With cricket. Cricket, yes. He he used to. That was his way of yeah. uh, teaching people who were coming into the commentary box. Yeah. He said. Don't describe or talk about what people can see. Give them the insights and the benefit of your knowledge, yep. things that they don't know. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant advice. Yep, 100%. 100%. Mm. Let, let's go, let's get to the part in, in 2000. Mm. 2000, massive year. Yep. Crazy year. On the eve, you got obviously your journalist, mm. the biggest event in the history of Australia, the Sydney Olympics. On the eve of... Sydney Olympics, you have, you're assigned to do the broadcasting obviously down there and you have a bit of a meltdown. Mm. That was more than a bit of a meltdown. A bit, a bit more of a meltdown, but go through that e- experience of, because I think uh, after that you're diagnosed with like bipolar or something like that. Mm. Go through that experience, it, w- what you can remember that night, the eve of the 2000 Olympics. Well, it was building up for seven months and you don't wake up one day bipolar. No. Uh, you know, once you've got the the back history and you look at your life and with 2020 vision, you know there's mood swings and that's what bipolar uh, is. That's the these massive highs and massive lows. And this one was the culmination of the mother and father of all highs and lows. It really? just happened around the Sydney Olympics. I'd experienced a, a depression for seven months before the Olympics and I was a mess. I, I soldiered on. I kept working. How, I don't know. How I did my job, I don't know. I was just so seriously depressed. Couldn't get out of bed some days yeah. and ended up suicidal towards the back end of of 2000. And that's if, – if you're suicidal, you're in a bad way. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're in a bad way. And I, I didn't ever think I could be in that position. And if you'd said to me eight months before, who's the last person in the world who could be suicidal, I would have said me. Yeah. Wouldn't happen. Far. Couldn't happen. I'm not that bloke. And yet it was – Wow. Uh, within eight months. So I finally got to a doctor. It took ages. I'm a typical yeah. bloke. I didn't go to a, to see anybody because I was proud and, and had an ego I didn't, and I was embarrassed. Yeah. Finally got to a doctor and he diagnosed me very quickly with depression Yeah, and put me on medication. And it took five weeks before I felt better. In fact, I felt worse for the first 10 days. So okay. I thought, I'm thinking the Is that medication. Because of the medication? Well, it's because of the depth of the depression. It yeah. was so deep, it was still bottoming out before the medication started to work. And mm. it takes weeks and weeks for medication to work. It doesn't in. work like a no, like a not, Panadol. Like a Panadol, yeah, no. I was going to say, Nurofen or something no, like that. No, it doesn't work like that. Really? So I'd bottomed out and I was at the you know, lowest point of my life and then the, the medication did work, antidepressant medication did work. And over the next five weeks, I started to go high. And with bipolar, if you take antidepressant medication, it can actually fuel the high. It can actually send you high and give you a manic episode. So mm-hmm. I had a manic episode and then on the train station, I was about to get on a train to, to go to Sydney to work on the Olympic Games. Yeah. Career highlight, you know. Yeah, I was going to say. A like career, life highlight. I mean, you tell a kid who's on a dairy farm milking cows at 12 that one day he's going to be in an Olympic Games – Commentating as a journalist, as a journalist, as a commentator his dream. in his own country in Sydney, you'd go, well, that's not going to happen. But it was about to happen. But yeah. I didn't get there and had a psychotic episode on the station, um, picked up by the police and taken to a psych hospital in Newcastle. And, and what, what was the what was that trigger trigger part? Was it just everything built up and then just the 
the location you're in. And what when you said I had a psychotic uh, episode, what what do you remember what was going on? What you're saying? What you're doing? Well, you asked me, and I've been asked a hundred times, what triggered this? Yeah. What triggered it was a perfect storm. Okay. It was a perfect storm that day. There was the depression. There was the medication on top of an undiagnosed bipolar disorder. So no one knows I've got bipolar disorder. So I've had the big low. I've had the big suicidal depression. Then I'm coming out. No one notices the high, least of all me, and it becomes mania. And with bipolar one, you have a a psychosis. You don't get that diagnosis unless you have a psychotic episode. And remarkably, even though I was dreadfully unwell, I've got a very clear a very clear recollection of what happened that day. I started to get um, aggressive, not physically, yep. but verbally aggressive okay. with, with total strangers. Really? And that's why the police were, were called. And being psychotic, you lose your grip on reality. You're delusional. You are, well, you're effectively insane. Yeah. You're insane at that point. And so the, you know, I, I was, I thought I was Jesus Christ. That did day, you? seriously, I, I did. Wow. Uh, I thought I'm Jesus Christ reincarnated and you don't get any higher than that or any crazier than that. Yeah. And um, so within, yeah, within 15 minutes, I'm at the psych hospital and diagnosed bipolar one. Once it was all put together, it didn't take long. Really? Mm. Wow. And what, so you're, you're dealing with this. H- how was the family notified? What, what was going on like, fuck? Well, I'd only been dropped off at the station 25 minutes before or half an hour before to yeah. catch this train. I had my bags ready. I had a media pass around my neck with my name on it to go to the Olympics. And literally within half an hour, they're getting a phone call to say there's something dreadfully wrong with Craig on the train station. You better come back. So police called family called. I had a good mate on the station, really good mate. We played cricket together for 15 years. Well, guess what happened there? I abused him. Yeah, right. I abused him. And he's obviously since, you know, he he's forgiven me and yeah, uh, yeah. in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Once he knows this is not me. In fact, yeah. he, he said to the police, this is not him. This is not the guy I know. Yeah, There's yeah. a problem. So, yeah, that's uh, – and then, of course, work was notified Yeah, uh, and they took my media pass because clearly I was going nowhere. And the great blessing out of all of this was I didn't catch that train. Yeah, right. Because if I'd caught that train and ended up in Sydney at Central and had that episode, that psychosis, down in Sydney, I don't know anyone there. Yeah. And – the ramifications, the potential for that to go just pear-shaped, completely pear-shaped, mm. would have been huge. Mm. Whereas in Newcastle, okay, we know this guy, doesn't take too long for people to come, this is not the bloke we know yeah, and okay. there's a problem. Yeah, right. Mm. So you end up at the, the psych home, hospital, so to speak. What's the next What's the next umpteen months rollout like? Mm. What's – well? Because you've got you to come to the accountability that, fuck, I've just, you know, mm. what is wrong with me? What, you know, you've been diagnosed, What what's my next steps? Yeah. Because you know, obviously you've got work, the family, everything's going around. Everything would be would have been going around in your mm. head just going, fuck. Well, not initially. I was too unwell. Yeah, true. I mean, I was in hospital for 12 days. Now, things have changed a lot. If today – for instance, anybody had an episode like that, a psychosis like that, they'd be in hospital for months. They'd be in yeah. hospital for months. I was discharged uh, in twelve days. Yep, way too early, but yeah. that was the just that was the the deal then. Yeah. Given some medication and basically said uh, good luck, and that was then mood stabilizing medication. Antidepressants were taken away straight yep. away because you don't just give those to people with no, no. bipolar. And then you know, I was too unwell, so I didn't have any regrets. I didn't even think about what I'd missed mm. probably until about the three-month mark. Yeah. And then I realised what I'd missed and the opportunity that I'd missed. Yeah. And I was uh, dreadfully disappointed mm. about it, yeah. as you would be. As you would be. Career yeah. highlight yep. doesn't happen, life yep. highlight. So I was, I had to come to terms with that and that took 
a few months. But the amazing thing was, I think I had the insight at that time to go, well, I can't change this. I can't change it. Mm. It is the past. Yeah. I can be pissed off. I can kick some stones and that's fair enough, but I'm not going to let this drag on and dominate my life and my thinking beyond a few months. And I'm certainly not going to, in a year, two or five years, going to be regretting it. And I haven't. Yeah. I haven't regretted the, uh, I don't lie awake at night and go, oh, what if? Yeah. No, it happened. It, yeah. As they say these days in sport, Rich, it is what it is. It is what it made that, that word come, those words come a lot. Mm. It is what it is. So he, you're recovering from that work-wise, ABC. What happened there? Do they still, obviously they were supportive of you then or did they go, nah, fucking, we've cut you? Well, that's probably the most, along with the family support, which yes. was just amazing, friends' support, just amazing. The You know, so lucky yep. and able to afford good medication, absolutely amazing yep. at a job. But the ABC could have, and many, many employers, after what had occurred, yes. would have said, mate, you're in a too hard basket. You know, you've had this depression, you've had a month off, now you're psychotic at a train station and you're in a psych hospital for 12 days and you got bipolar mm. and you need another three months off. Mm. They could quite easily have said, and many other employers could have said, too hard, mate, yep. got to let you go. Yep. But they didn't. They supported me and they said at the time, we don't understand what's going on with you. Yep. But as long as it takes, we're here. And uh, I got back to work after three months and there was no big deal made about it. They didn't, you know, there yeah. was no no eggshells. Stigma, it was like, oh, no stigma. Yeah. Like, just a bit of a staff me and next staff me, oh, oh, Craig's back today, you know. Yeah. Everyone gave me a clap and on we went. And yeah. they didn't expect me to do all the duties. In yeah. fact, the, the boss said, you know, if you need to work four hours today, yeah. work four hours yeah. until you build up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that, that must have been a massive help and support when you then, because you're not thinking, fuck, now I haven't got a job because of this thing that happened to me. Mm. So, but yeah, when you say luck, it's, not, it's you don't really say, oh, I'm very lucky that happened. It, it's very, it's a very amazing situation you're in with your family that supports you 100 million percent, mm. but then your work obviously stuck, stuck by you and mm. went, we're here for you, take as long as you need, but we're here for you. Yeah. Climbing out of that, you're back to work, back to obviously medication, back to looking after yourself. Now you start to become one of the the big building, one of the big profiles in Australian speaking around around the countries in mental health and well being. Again, author of books which we'll get into, but was did that motivate you? What was the motivation there to go? You know what? I know I've gone through all that mm -hmm. mentally, physically, with everyone else who's gone around that with me. What motivated you to then go, I need to go and speak? Was it a – because I find when I speak about obviously trauma or things that happened to me, I speaking about helps me. Mm. Some people don't like to speak about it because it doesn't help them. Yeah. Going out into the public forum, did, th did that help you – start to recover and and get more uh, awareness and, and what you've gone through or what you went through? Well, it's been cathartic. It has been good to do it, yep. to speak and tell the story. And every time you tell the story, a little bit more of that embarrassment drops away, drops that away. stigma drops away. I haven't given a stuff what anybody thinks about me. No. Or the fact that I've been mentally unwell and have a diagnosed mental illness for 18 years. I couldn't give a stuff. People will think what they think. Yeah. you got no control over no. that. So, uh, you know, for Joe Bloggs, who doesn't know me, has never met me no. and wants to judge me based on that, well, go, go your hardest, mate. Yeah. I'm putting my head on the pillow every night and sleeping well. Exactly. I wanted to speak. Once I'd recovered, I got angry 
Yep. And I didn't get angry because I'd missed the Olympics. I got angry because I realised that my experience had happened to many families yep. and many individuals and mental health, mental illness had always been one of those things that families just had to shut down and they had to fight the battle themselves because the stigma was so great that they wanted to protect the person who was mentally ill. And so being public about it was – you know, it was taboo. Yeah. And that's always been the problem. And it's like when you're dealing with stuff like that, you're fighting not only the illness, but it's like fighting the illness with one arm tied behind your back. Yes. So you don't have that support because uh, you've only got that nuclear family and mm. it can be bloody horrendous. Mm. So I thought I've come through, I've been blessed with the support that I had. So I'm going to tell my story with the the hope that it will help the next person. Yes. And and realistically, like we all talk about mental health and physical health and all the rest of it, but in my and this is only my opinion, everyone has some sort of mental illness. Mm. Something that always reflects back to them, whether it's childhood, whether it's what they've just gone through yesterday. We have all got that. Mm. But when you got someone who's speaking the truth from their heart, like yourself, going out into the public forum and telling your story and not caring about people's opinions because half the time mental illness is because you're worried about what people think of you. Yeah. But when you when you let go of that, I don't fucking care what people think. Mm. And I've always got this, this saying now, I'm not quite sure if it's good or not, but I go, the older I get, the less humans I want to hang around, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure because I'm 50 this year. But yeah. but for you, and I've done public speaking myself, uh, as you know. But for you going out there and speaking to other and making a bit of a difference mm. in talking about it and getting the subject, the stigma, or anything. What what's some of the feedback that you've received? Because some of the feedback sometimes, and I get sent even today, sometimes. That's some of your highs. That's that's some of your. I'm I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, that's my purpose. Well, I can tell you two stories, and I've heard, you know I've been doing this stuff now for eighteen years, speaking. Yep. All around the country, very very small towns. Yep. Some big conferences. Yep. I've done the lot. Yep. Community forums. Two stories, and these motivate me. Yep. To keep doing what I do. Yep. I went to a town called Bullaroo in South Australia many years ago, and it's a small town. Yeah. Uh, Newcastle's got a Bullaroo, but this is a different Bullaroo. <laughs> yeah. It's over not far from Port Pirie. Yeah. And they'd had some issues with mental health. I think they had had a couple of suicides in yeah. the town. They wanted a speaker. So I went, and it's a small town, but I think they had 400 people come. Yeah, really. And yeah. I'm doing my talk, and there was two older guys. Uh, it was a week area yeah. and two older guys, they would have been about 80 and they were sitting at the front of the room and I sort of laughing and joking between themselves. And I did my talk and after the talk finished, one of them came up to me and said, look, I want to thank you for coming to Uluru, coming over to talk to us. He said, I understand a lot more about depression and mental illness today than yeah. I ever knew yeah. based on what you've said. He said, 40 years ago, my daughter went to work at the Adelaide Hospital. She was a nursing unit manager. She was the ducks of her school. She took some pills and she didn't come home. Wow. And she took a life. We didn't see it coming. He said we had no idea about this stuff. We didn't know she had a problem. We wow. didn't know anything about depression. That rocked us to the core. I've heard a lot of stories like that. And he was the sad bit. He said, when this happened, and you bear in mind it was 40 years ago, mm. when they'd walk down the main street of this town, friends they knew would cross the road. Yeah, Cross really. the road. They, because they didn't, want to, didn't know what to say to them. Yes, yes. It, the conversation was too hard. Yeah. So not only had they lost their daughter to suicide – they couldn't talk to anybody about it. So there's no counselling. So that's one reason. And that's yes. one story. Yes. But the cruncher is I'd started speaking in Newcastle. Uh, I did a, a talk 
many years ago. It's probably about uh, one of the first ones I did. I yeah. did my 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 talk. I thought, well, who are we going to get to come to this? I mean, you know, who's going to come along to a mental illness talk and someone talking about depression? I thought, you know, there'll be thirty people there. Mm. But let me go on the radio and talk about it. So I went on the radio, went on the ABC, and I described what depression was like. So, you know, I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, anxiety, social withdrawal, negative thoughts. Uh, and then I was suicidal. I said, I was suicidal mm. with all of this. And a bloke rang the radio station and he talked to the producer who was on that day and said, this bloke's talking about me. He said, he's, he's describing exactly what I'm going through. Mm. He said, I have been depressed for five years, six years. He said, I have bouts of it. He said, I've been suicidal five or six times. He said, my wife doesn't know. My kids don't know. My boss doesn't know. My mates don't know. And I haven't been to the doctor. Yeah, wow. And so the producer who took the call said, look, you've done a really important thing here. You've made that first step. You've made that made first step today. Hang on. Craig will, Craig's off in a minute off the radio. He'll talk to you. And this bloke just went and hung up. Wow. He said, and he said, it's too hard. I can't do it. And hung up. Ah, oh, shit. So the next night at the forum, we've done my talk. I'm down the front of the stage and a, and a girl, she's about 16 and she walks to the front and she's crying. She's really upset. And she comes over to the stage. It was a rough night. I mm. mean, we'd been talking about some pretty rugged stuff. stuff. Yeah. And I just said to her, I said, you know, you've done it, done it tough. You're depressed. You've got depression. And she said, no. She said, I'm fine. She said, I just came to say thanks. She said, because um, the man that rang up yesterday was my father. Wow. And we got him some help. He told mum, as soon as, soon as he got off the phone, he told mum. Uh, he had depression. He told all of us. And uh, we got him into a doctor. Fuck. But that, so that's why you do what you do. 100%, 100%. Mm. And, it, and it just sometimes it's just those little simple things of you just talking on the radio, but people, when it when they're hearing it, mm. fucking bang, it yep. happens. Yep. So you get through that, you're doing your speaking all over the place and what made you, you've wrote two books. Mm. What, what made you, obviously the speaking is the part and you want to get your message out to everyone. Mm. Is that what the, the books were about as well? Because the two books you've done yep. talks about one's obviously um, broken, open. Yep. Uh, and the other one's The Better Life with Craig Hamilton. Yep. What, what, what's the inspiration behind the books? Well, the, the first book, uh, Broken Open, was about um, – was never going to be written. Okay. It was never going to be written because I was actually asked by a book publisher to – if I wanted to do a book because they knew about the story. My, my situation was very public. Yeah. You know, when you've got a bit of a profile in Newcastle, it doesn't take long for, for that news to, to get around and um, – publisher Jane Southwood yeah. was working at Random House Books in Sydney and, and she rang one day and she said, you want to do a book? And I said, absolutely not. Yeah, really? I, I, no way I'm putting this stuff out there. I said, ring me in a year yeah, and uh, I'll see if I change my mind. And almost to the day, she rang me back yeah, really? and I said, yeah, I'm ready to write that book. And so it's, and it was written because it, what got it across the line, I, I love quotes Yes. I love quotes. They inspire me and you, you learn so much. And I read one from Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. in the late 60s said, our lives begin to end when we remain silent about things that matter. Mm. And I read Powerful. it again. I said, our lives begin to end when we remain silent about things that matter. And I thought, if I don't tell this story, and I remain silent, my life will begin to end. It yes. won't become what it could become. That's right. And so the book was uh, released in 2004, and it's done well, sold a lot of copies in this yeah. country, yeah. and uh, which I'm, I'm very proud of. I was but say. it means the, the bigger picture, Rich, is that it, people need it. And they 100%. want it and they want the information. They want, they want to know, especially yeah. when they want to dive into – what they're feeling or what, mm. you know, they're open to talk about it. That's, yeah. that's, that's the thing. And being this, as well, we say. Well, they don't have to talk about no, it. No, no. All they have to do is go and get some help. 
They don't have to stand out on the corner with a loud hailer and say, oh, I'm going through the same thing exactly. that Craig Hamilton's going yeah, through yeah. or went through. But get a, the initiation. You don't wait until you get no, as bad no, as me no. either. But but that's the good thing about the book where you're, you're out in front Leading the way, you like mm-hmm. the Pied Piper, say. I'm one of I'm one of many, many, many hundred, many who are talking now, which yep, is great. Yep, the stigma of talking about personal things, your mental health, and and being upfront and honest, and a lot of people will follow yourself. Follow a lot of people who have been in dire situations who are mm. talking the truth from their heart. Mm. That's where you get the genuine followers. Go, that's happening to me. Mm. I don't have to talk about it. As you, know, I just need to go and get help. Yeah. Craig's doing the talking. He's helping me deal with what I'm dealing with. And I, th- I think that's amazing in regards to the speak- the speaking uh, that you do. The book's obviously coming out, mm. uh, doing that. If you're uh, – people are obviously listening and coming across and they're feeling that way, what's, what's you, been your biggest thing when you advise people? Because, again, it's, it's like everything when men – you know, us men, we, we all talk about the same thing. Women always get things off their chest because they'll get together and they'll mm. talk about all things all day long. That's how they get things off their chest, good or bad. Men, we like to hold it because we're weak. Oh, you're weak bastard. You're whinging, you're sook, harden up. You know, the old saying, get a cup of harden up, India. Mm. It, it's, can you feel the shift happening where men are starting to go, you know, it's, it's fucking not okay just to hold it to myself. I need to talk about these things. Mm. I need to get off my chest. The shift is happening yes. and it's been happening for a while because blokes are starting to realise that bottling it up and saying nothing when they're really struggling isn't working. It hasn't ever worked. But now I think, it, you know, the penny's starting to drop that I don't have to feel this bad. I can actually go and talk to someone. If I need medication for depression, I can be prescribed it. If I need medication for bipolar disorder to help me with these big mood swings, I can be diagnosed with that. There's all the lifestyle stuff Mm. I do, and I do heaps of lifestyle stuff. I've made that many changes to my life in the last 20 years. It's it's not funny, Mm. but I need to, right? I needed to, and I've done that. But as far as speaking about it, you're 100% right. The girls do it better. Women talk and they talk about stuff. They talk about their lives. And as a general rule, certainly in the past, we talk about the footy. We talk about having a punt. We talk about having a beer. We talk about anything. We talk about holidays. We talk about golf. We talk about the girls. We talk about the girls. girls, Yeah. 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 Well, well, we do. We're males, obviously. That's, that's. But we don't talk about our feelings. No. And we don't go and talk about how we're struggling. So if I had one bit of advice, it's always tell someone, tell someone, bring someone into your confidence. Even if it's, if it's a good mate who you can say, look, um, this needs to be remain between the two of us. I'm really struggling Mm. because it's like share. It's the old saying, you know, a a problem halved is a, uh, or a problem shared is a problem halved. Yes. That's incredibly important. Now, it might be with a counsellor. It yes. might be with a GP. It yeah. might be with a psychologist. Uh, it, it could be with your um, immediate family, but yeah. sometimes they're too hard, those conversations. Say, so that's I feel, there's a couple of things I feel, but some people, why they don't talk about it because they feel if they do talk to their uh, friends, their family, spouse, whatever, it's a burden on mm, them. Yeah, yeah. But if they actually talk to someone they do not know mm. and they were allowed to talk freely of get everything off their chest, yeah. some you hear the stories that oh, I talked to a counsellor, it was the best fucking thing I ever done. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't tell my wife. I didn't want her to worry. I didn't want her to be a, a burden to her, my sons, my ma- talk to even if it's not family member, friend, whatever spouse, talk to go and book into a counselor. Even if it's a one you're paying for a one conversation mm-hmm. to sit there and get so much shit off your chest. Yeah. You walk out some ninety percent of the time you'll probably walk out of there and go, Fuck, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. Well, that's true. When I first went to the doctor and I should have been there months, months before, months before, because I was in a bad place six months before I even got any help. Mm. And by the time I did get to see a GP, I was suicidal. So mm. you don't wait. 
till you're there. Uh, and once I put that on the table and shared that with the with the GP, I walked out after that appointment, and now I was still in a bad way. Mm. It's not a quick fix. No, no, having a definitely chat. not. And I, I was still that. in yeah, a bad 100%. way, but at least someone else knew. And there was a process to follow to be in treatment. And so that did help, but there was still a long way back. Do do you think it's a – in my head, it's like the older generation, and I'm including myself in this, where it wasn't cool to talk about your feelings. It wasn't okay to say that I'm feeling weak, I'm feeling down, I'm depressed or whatever. Do you think the next generation of males coming through – is some of the key factors why they're open to talk about their relationships, mm-hmm. their sexualities, their mental states, which then has a bit of the helping for the older generation to go, you know, if these younger guys are fucking talking about it, mm. I should probably go and do that too. Even though it might be too late in their years to go, oh, I should have done that when I was 20. Yeah. I feel the next generation of males coming through – a lot of them are so in touch with their feelings mm-hmm. and their emotions. They know when they're, fuck, I'm just not feeling right. Mm-hmm. I need to talk to someone. Yeah. Where the older generations couldn't bring themselves to talk to someone. I, I think that's the shift that I'm feeling as a 50-year-old. The new generation of males coming through, they're all in touch with their feminine side, their sexuality, their mental state. And if they don't like where they're at, they go and have a yap. They go and talk to someone. Mm. I hope that's the point. I hope that's the case, but yeah, it's it's a it's a different. There is a change, but I'm not. It's again, it's a, like a slow process, isn't it? It is, but I think you're right. I think you're right. Mm. I have a theory, Rich, that if you want to learn something, go and talk to a fifteen year old. Mm. Right. Go and talk to a fifteen year old because they have uh, the next generation. We underestimate the ne- the importance of the next generation. We underestimate the insights of the next generation, a lot of them are old souls. Oh, you know, they're old souls. They know. 100%. Intrinsically, uh, they pick up their energy, whatever it yep. is, I don't know. Yeah. But they come into the world a lot bloody smarter yep. and in tune with themselves than we ever did. Yeah. So, you know, they can solve some problems for us, but we never look there. No. We never look there. We're always looking. At the older know, generation. We're always we- looking to people in our own generation, which is fine yeah. because there's plenty of wisdom there as well. Definitely. But I tell you what, don't underestimate the knowledge. The, the knowledge and, and the insights a 15 year old can give you. And I think you're right. I think they are sharing yep. a lot more well, which than we cha- ever did. Which is changing the stigma, mm. I feel, because now everyone's going, oh, fuck, it must be cool to talk about it because 15 yep. year olds are males are talking about it. And two people that come to mind Harry Garcia, the boxer. Yep. He doesn't care what people think. He's no. battling his own battles. Yep. Such a. An amazing human he is. man. Another young one who no one knows about Oscar Langburn, a very old soul, but very young, surfing, just in touch with himself in in what I find talking to the to the young man. But the that part of the generation, it's all right to go back, let's go for the wisdom, let's go for the old blokes for the wisdom. But the new age knowledge, That's we it. have to start listening to the the 15 and 20 year olds because what we don't realise, they have watched us. Of course. And, and the generations like fashion, like anything, everything cycles around and changes. You go to the old bell bottoms. That went through the 60s and 70s. Yeah. 80s, 90s, that's so yeah. dog shit you and wouldn't look, even wear. But then it's is, changing back again. This is, uh, look, this is for another day. I mean, this is a whole discussion in itself uh, that we don't have time for today, but the impact of intergenerational trauma. Yep in our lives is huge. Now, if no one gets through with a, you know, a clean slate, no. everybody picks up, there's trauma everywhere, whatever it is, whatever it is. Uh, and some people suffer terrible traumas mm. in their in their childhoods. Mm. Some not so bad, but there's still trauma there. Yeah. And it impacts on you. Yeah, th- definitely. And, and later in life, it impacts on you. Those childhood traumas are through the teens and early 20s, may not hit you till you're 45, but when it hits you when you're 45, it hits you hard. Yeah. And that's where we see a lot of, um, you know, they call them midlife crisis. They're, mm. they're midlife breakdowns in a lot of cases. So uh, developing an awareness mm. about the impact of intergenerational trauma. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about 
uh, families yeah. who the great, great, great grandfather mm. might hand down brings up their his kids or her kids the same way that they were brought up. That's right. And it's handed on and it's handed mm. on and it's handed on and by the time it gets to you or your kids, if, you, if you're not aware, yeah. then all you do is uh, – you know, you, you just continue yep. on and repeat yep. history. Yes. We need to be aware of that. Yeah. And uh, as I said, that's a discussion yep. for another day. No, no, 100%. Getting to this stage, and again, you've you've had amazing life, what you've gone through and your passion and your, your career. If I was to say, uh, Craig Hamilton, right this day today, what what would you be your rich life like? What what brings happiness to Craig Hamilton on this day right now? Well, doing pretty much exactly what I want to do, and that is pretty much exactly what I'm doing uh, with a few tinkering. I don't think anybody, you know, you, you're living a you're living a brilliant life if you get up every day and you can say one hundred percent, this is what I want to do. I'm I'm not, I'm not there, but the, the things I'm really passionate about is continuing to speak. I've got a documentary I'm really uh, proud about. We haven't made it yet, but we're making it this year on suicide prevention. Mm. Uh, we're going to be talking to some great people in there. We're locking down names and locations now, but it, it's coming out mm. this year. It's called The Promise. Okay. So that's the next passion to do that. Amazing, yeah. Um, you know, the travel, I, I still love the talking. I haven't ruled out another book, but it's not on the horizon. it's not on the horizon. Yeah. But you know, I don't rule that out either. Saying I didn't that, think I'd ever write never one never. book. Yeah, I've written yeah, two. Yeah, so exactly. Who's to know? But and more stuff like this, mm. Rich. The awareness. Uh, where you know Broadcast media, mm. because you never know who's listening. Exactly. And one conversation can change a life. Yes. One conversation can save a life. 100%. Simple as that. Yep. Mate, it's been an honour to have you on the Rich Life Projects. We've known each other for a long time. We and have. I And yep. I know your story and, and obviously you know mine, but, mate, thank you for your time today. Mm. And uh been amazing, mate. Been amazing. Got to catch Thanks, up champion. with you at some coffee shop randomly. Ooh. It's, me, it's meant to be. We I hadn't seen hey. you for ages, and there we were. Next we minute, were. haven't even spoken for ages. Next no. minute, you cross paths. Next minute, boom, you're on the yeah, Rich Life Project. I'm in your booth. Hey, uh, talking, talking to you. Great to see you. Thank you, champion. Thank you.